Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, and we spend our weekly hour here at The Black Table devoted to discussion of issues of particular importance to people of African descent and to all others working together to build a better world. Um, today, we're going to continue that conversation with particular focus on uh, an amazing human being, someone whose life, which covered uh, almost three quarters of the 20th century, his life was spent as a diplomat, a scholar, an activist, a person who lived a life of the mind, even when he found himself in the middle of the formation of the modern world system, working to build um, a better world, certainly in his words, to build the brotherhood of humanity. Uh, that man is no other than Ralph Johnson Bunch. And here to discuss Ralph Bunch with us today is the author of the most recent work on Bunch, a magnificent tome in, entitled The Absolutely Indispensable Man, Ralph Bunch, The United Nations and the Fight to End Empire. Joining us today is Professor Cal Rastiala, who is a professor, a promised professor of comparative and international law and director of the Ronald W. Burkle Center at uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome, uh, Professor Rastiala, Cal. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no, it's a pleasure, man. I'll tell you, um, I was at the United Nations just going, you know, I was in New York, so let me walk over to the UN. We walked over and uh, we were in the bookstore and I saw this tome and I said, man, what? Of course, bought the tome. And as I'm sure many people who have read this book, and others who will read it, hopefully many after watching our conversation, will say, I couldn't put it down. Um, yeah, as a professor for now almost a quarter century at Howard University, where of course we have a Ralph Bunch Center, um, I brought it to class. We were discussing it with the students because Ralph Bunch isn't known on the campus of even Howard University where he was on the faculty. They don't, we, we know the name, but we don't. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book. I mean, I love the way you opened the book. <laughs> so give us some sense of why you even decided to take this on. Sure, so uh, you mentioned he's not that well known at Howard and honestly the same is true at UCLA. He, he attended UCLA, he wasn't on the faculty here, but he did attend UCLA, he loved UCLA. We have a Ralph Bunch Center as well. We have a, you have an institute, we have a center. Uh, we have a Ralph Bunch Hall and I have a building in, sorry, I have an office in that building in Ralph Bunch Hall. And that's really how I first kind of got into him. I had been aware of him because I've taught courses on the United Nations for many years. So I knew a little bit, but once I started spending time in Bunch Hall, I thought I really need to know more about this person. It's such an interesting seeming life. And when I dug in, I was just amazed. So that kind of launched me on this journey. Well, you know, I think it's interesting because as we were talking before we started taping, um, your book on Bunch sent me back to the Bunch bookshelf. I mean, his amazing, amazingly prodigious amount of work, his some of the published essays that he wrote with uh, yeah. for Gunnar yeah. Murdahl, of course, in American Dilemma, um, his his insights on Negro leadership, uh, and then also the books written about him. Of course, his chief deputy, Brian Urquhart, his book on Ralph Bunch, our friend uh, Charles Henry's book, and, and so many others. And I mean, realizing, of course, that at just under 600, I guess it's 660 pages with, with footnotes, you could have probably written three times the book. Yes. I was intrigued by the fact that your approach to Bunch, it, it seems to me, distinct from maybe everybody else, you're coming from a lens that you're, you're quite the, the, the kind of international scholar yourself, activist, you know, yourself, diplomat, working in the diplomatic uh, arena. Could you tell us a little bit about how your book kind of teases out these dilemmas that are at the heart of Ralph Bunch's life and career and how your your career yourself kind of gives you a lens that maybe is a little different than the rest of these folks? Sure. So, so first of all, you mentioned the book by Brian Urquhart, which is really uh, that biography is probably 30 years old, and that was the first thing I read about him and then Charles Henry's book. So there are some great books out there. I tried to, I think, reflect what I thought was, uh, to me, some of the most significant aspects of Ralph Bunch's life. And, you know, just in summary for, for viewers, he was a man who, you know, was, as you mentioned, both a scholar, a professor at Howard, uh, then a State Department official during World War II. He even worked at kind of the CIA, the early version of the CIA. 
Uh, he then went on to the United Nations. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. So he had an incredibly varied career. But I think because of my interest, my experience with international affairs, I did focus on that part of his life. And I also really focused on his professional success in, in, in the sense that I cover his childhood in just a few pages, really, in the beginning of the book. And most of the book is really about his, his adulthood, his professional life. Uh, of course, I talk a bit about his family life, and I was, I was lucky to get to know the Bunch family. They're uh, an amazing group of people. Uh, I got to know Ralph the third, his grandson quite well, as well as some of the cousins out here in LA, and they were all very helpful. Um, but I really tried to sort of focus on his contributions to, to really two things, I think, primarily. One, the creation of the post-war order and the United Nations, which was an organization he loved and devoted his life to. And related to that very closely was his, his lifelong interest and passion in racial justice, specifically in the form of colonialism. And he saw his work as uh, an activist, an advocate uh, for the black community here in the United States as just the other side of the coin of his work trying to roll back European empire and Africa. Those were, those were related, uh, closely tied things for him. And so I really uh, try to emphasize that in the book and tell that story as best as I can. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's fascinating uh, so many things about Bunch's life, but this this through line of race and his challenge as a person of African descent, born and raised in, in Jim and Jane Crow America, who was always an internationalist of some ways. It's fascinating to see how even as a very young man, he's thinking about the world. But to have lived through an engagement as a young scholar, as an, an, an undergrad, and then, of course, going off to graduate school and then teaching at Howard through the era of the League of Nations, to take that into the United Nations and to see then, and yeah, I love how you write uh, in, later in the book toward the end where he says, perhaps it's the most American thing in the world, the black revolution. It's like, wait a minute, what is Ralph Bush doing? I mean, as you, as you say, he's a pragmatist on one side and more than an idealist, but could you, could you talk a little bit about how those early years, and I'm thinking now, even beyond the UCLA years, as he's finishing his doctorate at Harvard and he's on the faculty at Howard, he is very early on considered probably a radical. It's fascinating how he re-encounters these cats all the way through his life, Du Bois and E. Franklin Frazier. But he's on the faculty with Frazier and, 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 and Emmett Dorsey and them. Is he, would, he, would you consider him a radical when he was a younger scholar and academic? Yeah, in some ways he was. And he, he himself later in life said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but basically I had radical views when I was younger. Uh, he was always careful to say, though, that he wasn't a demagogue. He was always a kind of sober, thoughtful, kind of grounded person. And that's like a through line in all of his different uh, aspects of his career. But his ideas in the 1930s when he's at Howard, uh, and at the same time he's working on his PhD at Harvard, he's kind of going back and forth, they were pretty radical. So he writes a book called A Worldview of Race uh, as part of a series uh, that Elaine Locke, another Howard faculty member, very eminent uh, writer and thinker, puts together. And that book is, is very Marxist. Uh, it's a, it's, although it's about race, it's as much about class. And he lays out a pretty, um, I would say, sophisticated and radical vision. Um, which he later repudiates uh, when he becomes very famous and sort of a little more of a, I guess, more of a sober thinker uh, later in life. He says, well, that was a hastily written book. And, um, but those ideas were, were uh, they weren't extreme, but they were definitely radical. And that was common at Howard at that time. So I think that milieu helped him a lot. Absolutely. And it's funny because, again, I'm telling you, man, your book sent me scurrying around my bookshelves. I, I reread A Worldview of Race. Here it is sitting right here because because you really help us understand that Bunch never leaves his commitment to our common humanity. But at the same time, he is literally at the center of these emerging debates. And, you know, one of the things, as you just commented on, you know, one of the things we see him do after even a, a worldview of race, he is in constant dialogue with folk who eventually he may diverge from, but he's always diplomatic with it. Could you say something maybe there in the 1930s uh, about just mentioning and we'll take a break. We'll come back 
you know, he's involved with this National Negro Congress. They put on these huge social science conferences at Howard. There's an intellectual ferment there that I'm not sure we have even today have replicated. I mean, could you talk a little bit about his engagement with the world through this lens of race, even as he's saying race isn't shouldn't be the grounding kind of center of our efforts to make a better world? Yeah, I mean, I think that was in many ways really Howard was the was the big influence on that. He certainly thought about racial issues, of course, uh, early in his life. And when he goes off to Howard, sorry, when he goes to Harvard to start graduate school, Howard kind of poaches him while he's in graduate school. Um, he's not really thinking about race as a central focus in his in his PhD. But then he gets to Howard. And uh, Charles Henry, I think, called it a Black Athens in the 1930s. It had an amazing group of people. You mentioned some of them. And he gets involved in all of those organizations that you just mentioned, works with what was really a stellar group of faculty uh, at Howard. And I think that really inculcates in him uh, this spirit of thinking about both class and race as central issues. But obviously, race was, was foremost in the minds of him and his colleagues. Uh, and that ends up influencing a lot of the work that he does on colonialism, because again, while colonialism was a very common feature in the pre-war era, it wasn't necessarily something that people thought about in the United States or studied in a serious way. And he took that on. He was almost unique in that. Excellent. Well, thank you, Cal. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to uh, follow our man, Ralph Bunch, as you open up so beautifully in the chapter entitled The War. As his car arrives at the White House, as his cab arrives at the White House in May 1940, and we see Ralph Bunch take on another dimension that certainly kind of spells out the rest of his life. Uh, so uh, we'll be back in a moment. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll be back with uh, our friend and discussant, Cal Rastiala, the author of The Absolutely Indispensable Man. We're talking to Ralph Johnson Bunch today. We'll be back, to back in a moment. We feel the hidden impacts of climate change that land harder in black, brown, and native communities. Not many people talk about it because they clearly don't know our lives. But with President Biden's landmark infrastructure and climate plans, our issues are finally seen. Removing lead pipes means we know our water is safe. Cutting carbon pollution helps our kids breathe easier. 1.5 million new jobs mean stable work in communities. The impact we need. Right now. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm Greg Carr, joined today by Cal Rastiala, the author of The Absolutely Indispensable Man. And Prof, when we left, uh, we see Ralph Bunch at Howard in that conversation. And again, I mean, working at Howard, I can tell you, man, we don't have that conversation about who was there at the time. I mean, we didn't even mention Eric Williams, who ends up back in Trinidad. And I mean, it's just everybody is there having this conversation. But then Ralph Bunch um, is summoned to the White House. He actually reaches out uh, for a conversation with Eleanor Roosevelt, of all people. Talk to us a little bit about that decade of the 1940s, where we see him engage not only the federal government, but get involved in this in this American dilemma uh, challenge as this country begins to think about what a post Jim and Jane Crow world uh, country might look like. And so they they, they call on, a, of all people, a Swedish social scientist, the Carnegie uh, Foundation. And Ralph Bunch finds himself at the center of, of these conversations as well. Yeah, that's right. It's an interesting story that, that the Carnegie uh, Foundation in deciding to do this book, The American Dilemma, which proved very influential uh, later, you know, in Brown v. Board and other decisions it was relied on. Um, they chose a guy who knew nothing really about American life, certainly nothing about racism, nothing about the South. And so um, he needed help. And they assigned to him a bunch of different people. They tried to recruit promising young scholars to work with him. And, and Dr. Bunch was one of those people. And so he actually traveled around the South uh, with, with Myrdal. Um, and Bunch had not really spent time in the South. Um, in fact, in a lot of ways, his life up until that point had really been in predominantly white cities. LA, when he was growing up, was a largely white city. Uh, you know, of course, Cambridge, Mass. Uh, was pretty white. And so this was his first experience really going into 
um, a very different environment. And, you know, it was an amazing experience for him. He, he wrote over 3,000 pages of memos out of this. And that's the reason he ends up at the White House, is he is seeking advice uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt, who doesn't know him. Uh, he just kind of cold calls her, you know, in a letter. And she invites him to lunch uh, to talk about the work he's doing on that book. And then they end up getting into a conversation that's much more varied. And they actually talk about the, this is of course 1940, the war is already going on in Europe. A lot of questions about whether the US will enter uh, what's gonna become World War II. And they talk about that and they talk about Nazism and the threat of Nazism. And it turns out they have kind of a mind melt on a lot of things and she really likes Bunch and he really likes her. Uh, and they do end up having a kind of friendship over many, many years. So, um, so that whole period of the early, late 30s into early 40s is a pivot point because shortly after he is recruited uh, into what becomes known as the OSS, which is later the CIA. So it's the first kind of intelligence uh, apparatus that the United States really has. And that's all designed to get us ready for this war that FDR knows we are going to enter at some point. And when Bunch is recruited into that, he doesn't hesitate, even though he's had this really stellar career as a professor at Howard. Um, he's quite patriotic. Uh, he thinks Nazism is a uh, existential threat, not only to America at large, but to black people everywhere on the planet. And so he is... Uh, happy to join that effort. And he really never goes back to academia after that point. So although he thinks he's going to, and he talks about it, he never does. <laughs> you know, and, and, I'm glad, and I'm glad this gives us an opportunity. Thank you for framing it that way. It gives us the opportunity to, to kind of go back and forgive me if we kind of jump around a little bit, because it's, sure. it's so fascinating. We didn't even talk about the fact that when you, that bunch who I guess can be mistaken, the South Africans kind of didn't know what to do with him. Is he black? Is he colored? You know, <laughs> as, he's, as he's traveling there, he had spent time on the continent of Africa. Yes, um, yes. Uh, our colleague, uh, now retired, my friend Bob Edgar, of course, edited his South African diary, uh, his journal that he kept rather. And of course, as he writes and does that dissertation on Togoland, this whole framing of mandates, this whole uh, framing of territories that he's going to spend the rest of his life grappling with, uh, he's in London. He becomes very good friends with Paul Robeson. But of course, as the war broke, breaks out, and this is where I'm going with it, Bunch is a pragmatist. He said, this is the world we live in. Maybe not the world you want to live in, but he finds himself criticizing uh, Paul Robeson in part around Russia. Uh, yeah. Du Bois, the generation older than him, Du Bois is like, maybe we shouldn't get in this war. And Bunch like, hey, man, the Nazis are worse than anything that you could. Could you talk about how Bunch's pragmatism informs his politics, even as he is in conversation and, and, and very much friends even with a lot of these folks, particularly black folks, are thinking internationally and saying maybe we shouldn't we should stand against this emerging uh, framework, the dying empire framework of Churchill and the and the being born again kind of paternalistic framework that maybe Roosevelt and some of them are, are proposing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So, so first of all, with Robeson, it is interesting. He meets Robeson in London. He goes there, Bunch goes there for some kind of training in anthropology, meets a lot of people who end up becoming post-colonial leaders in Africa that he works with later. Uh, it's, a, it's a really formative experience. But he and Robeson really get along, but he doesn't understand Robeson's, number one, his enthusiasm for the Soviet Union. Bunch is skeptical about that. And... Um, you know, he just doesn't get that. And as time goes on, he and Robeson split more and more. Um, but you're right, Du Bois is another person who during the war, and I think I spied a photo of Du Bois up on your shelf. Yes. Uh, before the war, uh, you know, first of all, when Bunch was very young, before he goes to, to Harvard even, he writes to Du Bois, uh, sends him this letter sort of telling him about who he was and what his aspirations were. Uh, so he really looks up to Du Bois, uh, as I think any any young uh, educated, uh, ambitious person of that era would have. Uh, and then when the war rolls around, you're right, Du Bois has a kind of odd take on it in some ways. He thinks that the, the kind of colonial uh, efforts of Japan, Japan is conquering parts of Asia at this point. Uh, and du Bois says, you know, that's something to watch, this kind of, uh, you know, new Asian empire. And Bunch just thinks, no, you know, that's just colonialism in another form. Um, it's it's terrible. And and the other point you made of is this war that's happening 
uh, something that our community, the black community here in the United States needs to care about. Bunch thinks absolutely yes. And that was a common thread to think that maybe this was a white man's war. And Bunch pretty forthrightly takes that view on and rejects it and says, you know, this war is, is number one, a war for, for freedom and democracy. Um, but the Nazis, what they have in mind, their racial theories are worse than anything than we've ever seen. Uh, and so he's really adamant on that point. And I think, you know, that again shows his kind of pragmatism that he, he had a good eye for recognizing tyranny and understanding that, yeah, the United States at that time was a terrible place uh, for him uh, and, and for black people everywhere in, in the country. Um, but things could be even worse in his view. And so we had to fight this war. And so again, he doesn't hesitate to join the effort because he thinks it's of, of overriding importance. Absolutely. And, you know, as you write and as you're discussing now, I mean, Bunch from very a very young age was absolutely for decolonization. I mean, you say whether he's writing or talking about mandates and colonies and, and moving forward to really figure out how that process works. And another thing that's very fascinating is, again, as he's at the center of policymaking, we see other forces at work. He's literally in the room at Dunbarton Oaks <laughs> when they're setting up the modern world system coming out of, of, of World War II. And then, of course, the U.N. shortly thereafter or kind of kind of parallel as they're emerging. He's at the OSS, as you say. So he's in conversations. You got John Foster Dulles sitting there and the girl Scott Heron used to joke. He said, John Foster Dulles ain't nothing but the name of an airport now. But at the time, <laughs> you've got and you've got an international group who is having conversations that Bunch is in. We had Maribel Mobley um, on, on uh, uh, last year to talk about her book, White Philanthropy, where she says, while the Carnegie Foundation is doing this work in the U.S., they're also involved in Africa, other places. There's this attempt to shape a world and Bunch himself almost as a civilizationist, as you write, in a sense that, yeah, we, everybody should be free, but maybe these African countries need a little help. And, you know, some of the ways that they have of doing things, which he knows about, of course, as a trained anthropologist, ended up in London first time, you know, are good. But then other ways they need to be brought into this. You know, could you talk a little bit about how some of his ideas about self-determination and um, the end of colonialism find their way into his work at what becomes the United Nations. And we'll pick this up after the break if you want to kind of lay the foundation for us and how these tensions bunch at the center of these conversations at the same time that there are other forces at work, which might push back against some of the things that he deeply believes in. And then we'll, of course, talk about Palestine and then Congo and some other places. But how, how does Bunch inject himself into these kind of institutions that are going to basically spell out what has happened, everything that has happened since in the world? Yeah, that is a great set of questions. So, so first of all, he is one of the only people who understands how colonialism really works. Uh, one of the only people in America to have actually visited Africa on the ground and done field work. So when they're looking uh, at the OSS and then at the State Department for someone who understands Africa, understands colonial politics, he's immediately the guy who's recommended. Uh, and so that's, that's his calling card. That's what gets him into the government. Once he's there, he is really interested in figuring out ways to to roll back empire and to help uh, African people and Asian people achieve self-determination. And so pretty quickly, he starts working when he kind of goes from the OSS to the State Department. He starts working on what becomes the UN Charter. You mentioned Dumbarton Oaks. Dumbarton Oaks is one of the early conferences to create the UN Charter. And, and his task is to think about a system that would enable colonies, particularly the defeated uh, powers, what they expected to be the defeated powers, Germany and Japan, to allow their colonies some pathway to independence. Uh, and you're absolutely right that Bunch was again pragmatic. He had visited and spent a lot of time uh, in some of these societies and knew that they would require assistance from the international community uh, to be able to kind of like stand on their own two feet, as he put it, uh, in the modern world. But he did not believe that they needed more time under colonial rule. This was a common kind of claim that the Europeans would use. They would say, oh, you know, yeah, of course, we're going to allow eventual independence, but uh, that's a long way off. And, you know, these places need our help. And Bunch said, no, that's not true. Uh, it's a moral imperative. It's a political imperative. Of course, the international community could be of assistance. 
uh, but independence has to be the goal. And so in many ways, the through line of my book is that effort at achieving freedom for people of color around the world. That was the guiding light in so many aspects of uh, Dr. Bunch's life. Absolutely. Thank you, Cal. We're, we're going to be back in a moment. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to find Ralph Bunch at the center of really many of the framing issues of the 20th century, the issues of Palestine and Israel, the question of the Congo, even Vietnam, ultimately. So uh, where his son, of course, is drafted into that war and we see him and he and Martin Luther King have a friendship and then tensions as well. So we'll be back in a moment with Professor Cal Rastiala, author of The Absolutely Indispensable Man, Ralph Munch, The United Nations and the Fight to End Empire. Back here at the Black Table in a moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, and we are discussing Ralph Munch, the United Nations, the International World Order, with Professor Cal Rastiala, author of The Absolutely Indispensable Man. Um, remember to support the Black Star Network and all of its shows. Become a member of the Bring the Funk fan club. You see the conversations we're having here are, are truly unique. Prof, you now have us in the era of the United Nations, and of course, in the wake of World War II, the issue of Palestine. Could you talk to us about um, folk, uh, Bernard, Ber, what is it, Bernadotte? Bernadotte. Bernadotte, Bernadotte yes. And uh, Ralph Bunch, and we, I mean, you can't cover a 660 page book, of course, in an hour, but you know, this, this, these brushes with death. I mean, him pulling Gunnar Murdahl out the South, talking crazy to these people. Well, you know, you know, hold on, man, you don't know what you're doing down here to these, to these assassinations. If he's sitting in one seat in the car, something else could happen. The plane crash we'll talk about later, of course, with, uh, with Doc Hammersall. Talk to us about Palestine. What, what, what kind of dilemma does that present for Bunch in this emerging world order? Yeah, it's a really interesting and, and a huge episode for him because it, it's what leads to him winning the Nobel Peace Prize and going from someone who was, you know, very professionally successful and even somewhat known in the black community because the black press would would write some profiles about him. Uh, but when he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, he becomes one of the most famous people in America. Uh, and that's all because of Palestine. Um, but in a nutshell, he is at the UN at this point. Uh, the war's over. He joins the UN as a, as a staff member. He's working on uh, issues of decolonization. And uh, the British, who had controlled uh, what was known as the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, uh, which was the territory that they had basically taken from the Ottoman Empire after World War I, and they are unable to figure out what to do about a problem we're all familiar with, uh, Arabs and Jews wanting the same land, and they hand it to the UN. And they try to... Uh, hope that the UN will somehow deal with this problem. And Ralph Bunch is one of the people who's immediately put in charge of figuring out what to do about Palestine. Uh, this occupies several chapters of the book, so I, I can't uh, you know, summarize it all that easily. But the upshot is he gets embroiled in the Middle East, which is a place he does not know about. He's not never really been there uh, before. And as you mentioned, he, he almost gets killed. Um, and in fact, the original mediator Bunch is appointed as the deputy UN mediator, 
uh, between uh, the new state of Israel and, uh, and its Arab neighbors. Uh, the original mediator, the Swedish count, uh, is driving along in Jerusalem and Bunch was supposed to be there with him in the car. And he gets delayed, there's a plane problem, he can't get there, uh, and the guy uh, takes off, the Count Folk Bernadette takes off in his car, they're driving along, and they're ambushed by what seems to be Israeli soldiers, but they're actually a dissident underground group who then pretend to have a roadblock and just gun down everyone in the car with machine guns, including the guy who is sitting next to the Count, who they believe to be Ralph Bunch. And so Bunch finds out about this very shortly afterwards. He's shocked, of course. Uh, and he's ultimately then put in as chief mediator in place of the count. Um, but he always views this as uh, you know, one, of, one of the many brushes with death that he has. And in fact, later, the assassin, uh, who was interviewed much later on, says, you know, we made a mistake that day. Uh, we should have killed the black man. He was the man with the ideas. Right. And they realized that Bunch was really the guy uh, behind all of the efforts of the UN in the region, which these dissident groups did not like. Um, but in any event, Palestine is, is, is a momentous experience for Bunch. After that narrow brush, after becoming the mediator, he helps negotiate peace between Israel and four of its neighbors. And that process then, uh, a little bit later, yields him the Nobel Peace Prize. And it's an incredible experience for him. And it also shows that he has skills he did not know he had. Uh, most importantly, he's a fantastic negotiator. He's a fabulous mediator uh, and he's very, very skilled at it. So it's a really life-changing episode for him. It's funny you say that. Uh, I'm reminded of something I saw that um, certainly one of the people you know, of course, one of his granddaughters is like when the grandkids would start fighting, Bunch would put them all in different rooms and then go to each of them and say, now, what do you want to get out of this? <laughs> so, yeah, so his negotiation skills are quite something. And, you know, as you were relating that, and thank you, right. I mean, everybody, you really have to get the absolutely indispensable man, read this text and see the skill and see the very volatile world. That, that the bunch was living in at the time and at the center of affairs. Um, even some of his longtime acquaintances, Du Bois, for example, very pro-Israel at that moment. Yes. Um, you know, and and at the same time, you know, Robin Kelly and others, as you as you write, uh, your colleague there, of course, our friend at UCLA, says, you know, there's really no sense in that small black American elite. Uh, uh, there's no conversation about Arab displacement, displacement of the Arabs there. Um, at the same time, the UN, uh, at least one of the things you quote, UN is saying, le UN leadership, you know, there is no vested interest in the status quo. Everything is so volatile. And then so the other thing that it, it makes me think about is in that decade of 50s, he wins the Peace Prize in 1950. Again, very self-effacing. By the end of the decade, you have folks like his old friend, E. Franklin Frazier, who he used to beat up Du Bois with. It's like, yeah, Ralph Bunch is an exaggerated American. I mean, they're, 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 you know, this, this this progress even domestically is a challenge because that progress hasn't come down into the masses of black people. It's basically for the black bourgeoisie. Could you tell us a little bit before we maybe spend some time uh, dealing with Bunch in Africa and the Congo crisis? This, could you talk about some of your thoughts on how Bunch's efforts to deal with racism in the United States, the domestic challenge, you know, the challenge of, of balancing that with or, or, or even linking that to international struggles to decolonize, particularly as Brown versus Board of Education comes uh, comes into fruition in 1954. And at the same time, domestic folk like Paul Robes and his friend and others are challenging the UN with we charge genocide and, and bunches in all of these conversations. How is he balancing the domestic war against racism with the global struggle for decolonization? Yeah, I think this is a really fascinating part of his story. And he, so first of all, as you know, and we talked about earlier, he was very active in the civil rights movement in the 30s and into the 40s. Once he joins the United Nations, he remains active in the sense that he's on the board of the NAACP, for example, but he is now an international civil servant and he's focused on international things. He doesn't feel he can speak out as much as he maybe wanted to or used to but he still uh, uses his position at the UN uh, to argue both publicly and privately uh, for greater racial justice in this country. And when he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, he's got a fantastic ability 
to do that because he's immediately besieged with so many invitations to speak all over the country. And he gives a ton of speeches. And I read, uh, I can say I read all of them, but I read a lot of them uh, doing this book. He gave thousands. And a lot of them kind of hit on a couple of points. And the most powerful, I think, in response to your question is he would often emphasize that this country could not, remember the Cold War is also starting pretty quickly by, by 1948, uh, Berlin is blockaded, by 1950, the Korean War is, is on. And so there's a Cold War context to a lot of this. And so pretty quickly he's arguing, look, we, the United States, cannot win this Cold War against the Soviet Union and especially cannot win uh, the allegiance of these new countries that are gonna come out of Africa that, that he was working on their independence, uh, if we have racial injustice at home, it is weakening us as a force. You mentioned Brown v. Board. In the, in the litigation, uh, the State Department puts a brief, Bunch doesn't have anything directly to do with this, but just to illustrate the power of this point, they put a brief in basically saying that, yeah, racial segregation is a national security challenge for the United States, and we need to overturn that uh, if we're gonna win the Cold War. So Bunch runs with that, and he's in fact one of the main people making that claim. So he's always very smart about thinking about how can I convince white America to understand why this is not only morally wrong, but also strategically wrong for us. Uh, and he really makes that case pretty powerfully throughout that period. Well, probably we only have a couple of minutes left in this block, but I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up. How in the hell then does Ralph Bunch get drugged before the House Un-American Activities Committee? <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a that's an amazing episode. Even um, so, so first of all, at that period, because of the Cold War, this hysteria over the idea that communists are everywhere, and the right wing in the United States believes the UN is just a communist uh, kind of uh, den. And so almost every American working there is subject to some kind of loyalty uh, investigation. Um, Bunch himself, he, he thinks of this in the sense that, you know, he's one of the most famous, uh, certainly most famous UN officials, one of the most famous black people in America at this point. And nonetheless, he gets dragged before this loyalty board hearing. Uh, and his past that we talked about earlier, his radical past, his association with Robeson, uh, with the National Negro Congress, which did uh, later kind of uh, have associations with communism. Uh, of course, co knowing about communism, talking about Marxism was pretty common in that period in the 30s and 40s. It didn't have the same valence it had later, but all of this is kind of dragged up from the past and used against him. Um, but what's amazing is he, in the midst of this hearing in Washington, this three-day hearing, uh, they adjourn early on the second day so he can go have dinner at the White House with President Eisenhower. So that's, you know, that's a sign of uh, how ridiculous the whole thing was. And the last thing I'll say is a little anecdote in the book. At one point during the loyalty investigation, he gets a visit from the CIA. They ask him about a couple of things. Uh, and he says, look, you know, you know, I'm under investigation by this loyalty board. Uh, I'm not sure I'm cleared for this. And they say, well, you're cleared with us or we wouldn't be here. So <laughs> it was as if everyone in the national security world knew it was a total joke, uh, but the Republicans were going crazy and he had to go through this. So um, of course he's exonerated in the end and it's front page news, uh, but it was something that really irritated him, actually. He was, he was kind of unhappy and felt like, look, everything I've done for this country, I can't believe I'm being dragged through the mud this way. So um, a crazy episode for sure. Absolutely. And it's a perfect way, actually, Prof, for us to, uh, after the break, spend our last section as you kind of explore how Ralph Bunch is one of maybe the principal parent of UN peacekeeping and how he's trying to keep the world basically from blowing itself up at the same time that, you know, the people of the world who he says must be self-determining, many have different ideas about what that world should look like. So we'll be back in a moment with Professor Kyle Rastiala, the author of The Absolutely indispensable man in the life of Ralph Johnson Bunch. Back in a moment here at the Black Table. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? 
I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr. Remember to support the Black Star Network, to join the Ring the Funk fan club, and to tell your friends all over the world about the conversations that we have here on the network and at the Black Table. Uh, we're finishing up today with Professor Kyle Rastiala, the author of The Absolutely Indispensable Man, Ralph Munch, The United Nations, and The Fight to em Empire. Prof, I mean, there's so much. I mean, Ralph Bunch, as you say, who bristles at this notion that he'd be anything less than patriotic, a man who has absolutely detests this notion of racial inequality or inequity. I mean, you write about how the fact the family dog dies and, and he goes to bury the dog and it's like, no, we have a part in the cemetery for black pets and white pets. He said, me and my wife and children, we, we, we'll take that job now <laughs> in New York. I'm not going to live with Jim Crow, you know, but on the international level, we now see Bunch get embroiled in the Congo. And for a lot of my friends and, and comrades who are Pan-Africanists, a lot of us who are Pan-Africanists, Ralph Bunch was not a Pan-Africanist. He no, tried no. to, you know, have a, a good relationship with Patrice Lumumba, but at the end, Patrice Lumumba, who, as we know, who is an icon to this day among so many, Ralph Bunch has to say, well, uh, one of the few people who actually met and knew Patrice Lumumba, uh, he even says at one point he detested. Patrice Lumumba. Ralph Bunch gets caught on the wrong side domestically from a lot of black folk. Baldwin, perhaps, Lorraine Hansberry, the protesters at the UN against what happened in the Congo. Yeah, everybody from Muhammad Ali, who's visiting there at the same time as Malcolm X, Ralph Bunch. At the same time, he is tasked by Doug Hammersall with put, put me an army together. And so he puts together the UN peacekeeping forces. Talk to us a little bit about the, how the Congo kind of sets the stage for everything we've seen since in terms of the role of the United Nations and conflict resolution and, and those kind of things. Yeah, great, great question. So the Congo is a huge episode for, for a bunch and a really big moment for decolonization in the post-war era. So in 1960, uh, a year bunch calls the year of Africa. Uh, there are 17 new states uh, that gained their independence. And the biggest one by far is Congo. Uh, and it's also the most complicated because the Belgians who had ruled Congo for so long in an absolutely brutal fashion uh, had done nothing to prepare Congo for independence. And Bunch and Hammerschold, who was the secretary general, somebody he's very close with, um, they know that Congo is definitely gonna need some assistance. You mentioned Lumumba. So Bunch flies over there for the independence ceremonies uh, as the kind of emissary and Hammerschel tells him, hey, you're going to need to spend a few weeks on this one. This one might be a little rocky. Uh, and honestly, that's kind of an understatement because within just a matter of days, uh, Lumumba takes over as prime minister uh, and the country starts to split apart. There's almost like a civil war that breaks out. Uh, one of the wealthiest parts of Congo tries to break away uh, in many ways supported by Belgium. Um, as a kind of way to keep kind of a white rule uh, on the most valuable parts. And Bunch is in the middle of this, uh, mostly arguing with Lumumba over what the international community can do to help keep Congo safe and intact. Uh, and he goes from admiring Lumumba, who was you know, very charismatic uh, and um, you know, in many ways a very impressive liberation leader, he ends up at the end thinking he's kind of crazy. Uh, and uh, really kind of losing, losing his cool with Lumumba on many, many moments, which Bunch doesn't do very often. Uh, Bunch almost loses his life in the Congo uh, as well. You mentioned, uh, one, he's held up at gunpoint several times in his hotel by, by kind of uh, you know, insurrectionist army members. But then you mentioned earlier in our discussion, the plane crash, which ends up killing uh, Doug Hammarskjöld, the secretary general, a couple of years later after the start of the Congo crisis, Bunch is supposed to be on that plane. And at the last minute in JFK airport, uh, Hammerschultz says "Bunch to Bunch, look, you should stay back because we need someone in charge uh, in case something happens. I'm gonna fly to Congo to try to, you know, one last time negotiate something. And then the plane in the middle of the night mysteriously crashes into the jungle. 
And everyone on board is killed, including Hammerschild. And to this day, it is not clear why it crashed or whether it was shot down. Uh, there's been many investigations uh, into that. But again, Bunch narrowly averts death and then has to kind of take over uh, the process. Uh, and just to circle back to where you ended your question with peacekeeping, yes, this is something that Bunch is extremely proud of. So uh, one of the things that the UN does in the post-war era that's really an innovation, uh, in many ways Bunch's innovation, is the idea of peacekeepers. So UN peacekeepers, the blue helmets, we've probably seen them on the news. Um, that gets started right after the war in actually in Palestine, which we talked about earlier, with a kind of observer version. But it really reaches a peak in Congo, uh, where there are thousands of UN troops uh, on the ground uh, and actually not only keeping the peace or, or trying to, uh, but engaging in war fighting. Um, they're actually, they've got tanks, they've got air power, uh, they're fighting bunches like kind of the general of sorts behind it. Um, and he masterminds a lot of this. Uh, and as you say, he comes under criticism for it because Lumumba becomes an icon to many people on the left when he's assassinated uh, by the Belgians, it turns out. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, the United States is... is Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 I think you were about to say it. I was, it would it be fair to, to evoke U.S. complicity? In yeah, oh, absolutely. So the United States is deeply involved in the Congo, very worried about communist uh, Soviet infiltration. And they are planning to assassinate Lumumba. They just don't get to do it. In some ways, the Belgians beat them to it. And so, um, you know, Lumumba's death is a big deal uh, throughout the black world, but also just throughout the kind of left-leaning world, socialist, communist world, uh, the third world. And so, you know, this is a huge moment for the United Nations. And Bunch does come under attack for his, uh, you know, his role not that he had anything to do with the death of Lumumba, um, but the fact that he was the highest ranking UN official involved, he's inevitably caught up in it. Absolutely. We only have a few minutes left. And again, thank you. I don't know how we did it, but we're getting close to that 660 pages. <laughs> we go through these few minutes, but I, I'd be remiss if we didn't spend a, a couple of minutes talking about his relationship with Martin King, uh, who he admired, although we know that both men didn't have much longer to live. When King comes out against Vietnam, you know, Bunch is rankled by that. Uh, at the same time, Bunch is with him arm in arm from Selma to Montgomery. Could you talk a little bit about kind of in conclusion as Bunch, too short a life, of course, 1971, he makes transition. You know, what do you think Bunch might make of today's world, particularly as he continued to to fight for a better world? And in that context, didn't live to see the implications of much that he put in place, including the civil rights movement. Yeah. Well, first of all, on Dr. King, he was a huge admirer. You know, they both had won the Peace Prize. Uh, but even before King wins the Peace Prize, they're both in Ghana, for example, in 1957. Yes. When Ghana gains independence, they meet there. And, uh, you know, he's very impressed with what Dr. King is doing with his... Uh, one of the reasons that Ralph Bunch does not like Patrice Lumumba is he saw Lumumba as someone who wanted to stir up people that was uh, a fan of a kind of hotter form of politics, uh, whereas he saw King as someone who took the moral high ground uh, and appeal to people's better natures. And that really appealed to Bunch. So he was a fan of King from the beginning. Uh, of course, when they win, uh, when they both have their Nobel Prizes, they're kind of a unique pair. And he works more and more with Dr. King in that period. You mentioned marching. Uh, he's at the March on Washington. Uh, also, he's nearing, he, Bunch, is nearing the end of his UN career. And he's feeling that he can speak out more on the issues of the day in the United States as the civil rights movement is gathering steam. And as he does that, Dr. King is the person he wants to, he wants to work with uh, most of all. You mentioned Vietnam. They do differ on Vietnam pretty strongly. When King gives his famous speech in Riverside Church, criticizing the war, Bunch uh, criticizes him publicly for it. They have a bunch of back and forth. They, they sort it out, but it's a little bit of a rift for them. Um, but King is definitely the person that he admires the, the most. Um, you asked about how he sees, uh, how he saw kind of race relations then and how he might see them now. Um, you know, it's interesting, towards the end of his life, in his archives, in his papers, he had a lot of what I would kind of call like introspective writing and musings about race relations in America in a way that he hadn't really done earlier in his life. 
And he was clearly troubled uh, by what he saw. And one of the ways I characterize it in my book is to say that, you know, Bunch had two missions in his career. You know, one was decolonization and the other was racial justice here at home. And again, they're both two sides of the coin for him. The decolonization effort is very successful by the late 60s. Most of the world has been decolonized uh, faster than anybody could have imagined, including Bunch. But by the time, um, you know, 1968, 69 rolls around, things are not looking that good, you know, at home. And he's troubled by what he sees as continuing ferment, violence. Of course, the, the killing of Dr. King really upsets him as it upsets everyone in the country. Uh, and so he's troubled by the fact that progress is not moving as fast as he had hoped. Um, I think if he were alive today, uh, he would still be troubled uh, by continuing segregation, uh, which was always something that really uh, concerned him. Um, he, he, I think, find a lot to be happy about, uh, but I think he would still be troubled by many of the persistent aspects of racism that we still have today, 50 years later after his death. Absolutely. And uh, in the minute we have left, I couldn't help but think about you as we saw Kamala Harris there in Ghana. Right. With the president right. of Ghana saying, we're going to negotiate with everybody, not just you. And of course, Bunch had been there with King, thought about the Bandung Conference. Here is literally the child of the of Afro-Asia <laughs> standing as the vice president. Is there anybody on the contemporary horizon that you might say this person has a, a an echo of a Ralph Bunch in terms of that this combination wow. of this? I don't, you know, I've been asked this question before and it's, he's such a unique figure. And part of the reason I wrote the book is because I think there is no one really like him. And his life is an extraordinary one, uh, not only because he overcame a world of, you know, incredible prejudice to achieve at the highest levels, uh, but because he had his hand in so many of the most important issues domestically, internationally. Uh, he was on a first name basis with every American post-war president through Richard Nixon. Um, he knew every major figure in American political life. So it's really hard to say who could match that kind of level of um, kind of elite access, but also popular fame. So I'll just quickly mention, as you know, I opened the book with the Academy Awards, 1951. Yeah. They get to the best picture and Fred Astaire brings on Ralph Bunch to hand out the best picture award. That was the kind of fame he had. Uh, so it's really extraordinary. And I'd say he really is someone without parallel um, and unfortunately not not well known as we began our discussion today anymore. But I, I hope this book helps to uh, to rectify that. I'm quite certain it will. In fact, the reason that we're very glad you uh, found some time to spend with us today is because we want as many people as possible to read the absolutely indispensable man to know not only about this man, his life and times, but the significance certainly of the last century in terms of our work to create a better world. So Professor Cal, Cal Rastiala, thank you so much Prof, yeah, for joining yeah. us. And I uh, hope one day you, you, you'll come back and we can continue this conversation. I would love it. Thanks for having me. Wonderful, of course. And we'll be back in a moment to cook the table here at the Black Table and prepare for next week. Back in a moment. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. There's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. <laughs>
Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Thanks for supporting the network and uh, joining the Bring the Funk fan club and spread the word. We'll, we'll keep the clearing the table brief today. Professor Rastiala has done an incredible service to us by writing The Absolutely Indispensable Man. In a, in a moment when young people have become, in particular, enamored with the concept of the Black Panther, we go back to Marvel Comics of the 1960s and understand that the original concept of the Black Panther in Marvel Comics, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and, and, and their crew, was to call him, in fact, very early on, his first iteration, what he was known as the Cold Tiger. The Cold Tiger, of course, was one of the nicknames for Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. Young people who are advocates of Black power and Black internationalism have a lot to learn from the life of Ralph Bunch, who knew the Cold Tiger, who tried to work with the Cold Tiger, who understood that Patrice Lumumba and every actor that he encountered lived in a world that isn't quite as simple as black and white, even as we must come together as a species before our extinction, which may be more imminent than we think, uh, becomes in fact a reality, we have to look back, look back at the life of Ralph Bunch and look back at him, not just because of his achievements, but because of his ideas, because of his commitment to help contribute to a world where, as he might say, we can live in peace. So join us next week here at the Black Table, and we are glad that you are here on the network with us, and we'll see you next week.